Okay, let's start with this session. Um, this session is about uh, measuring RF uh, frequencies and uh, try to detect what kind of device we have. And uh, this down to a level to individually identify devices. Uh, please welcome uh, Boris Danev. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. First of all, I want to say that this is a joint work uh, with me and my colleague, which is just here down, but he is not able to today. So we will be able both to answer questions, if you have, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, don't be afraid, the name is different of the presentation, but we will be talking exactly about the same things that is originally on the schedule. So what I will do first is um, I will do some background about device biometrics, which means can we find biometrics about network devices, any kind of devices? And then what is the meaning of hunting the individuality? Why do we need this? And, and so on. Then I will, I will have two use case studies. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, identifying uniquely wireless transceivers. So this work is uh, much more mature than the second one, which is based on RFID transponders. So for the next one, it's we, for the second one, we have preliminary results. So uh, if we have any questions or suggestions, we really appreciate because it might help us continuing better that work. And then I'll have a conclusion. So yeah, let's start. Uh, so what are device biometrics? Uh, we are trying to identify a component in a networked environment. It can be an operating system, it can be a driver, it can be a physical device itself. Actually a device that uh, emits this, some kind of information. And usually how we do this, how we, we try to build some kind of device signatures based on the analysis of the communication with that component or device, with or without um, uh, the component's knowledge. So the device might know that we are trying to uh, find some unique signature, or it might not know. And uh, this is also commonly referred as device identification, and uh, it spans a broad spectrum of technologies, like wired, wireless, uh, any type of protocols, and so on. And there are a number of different methods that have been suggested in the literature. Here we will talk about some of them only. Uh, we have to be aware about something uh, very important in uh, device biometrics, that it presents two very different perspectives. So the first perspective is the network authority. Uh, this can be used by any type of government or any type of network authority try to do law enforcement. For example, uh, law enforcement agencies in Europe, they're trying to identify illegal transmitters and try to, you know, put people in prison or whatsoever. <laughs> um, mobile operators, they have a different goal. They would like to identify cloned cell phones. Um, if you're a network administrator, you, you would like to identify, identify track problematic hosts. And, um, of course, you can include some other type of protections against identity spoofing and so on. So if you're able to have some kind of a unique signature of a physical device, even if someone tries to spoof the identity by cha changing the SSID or MAC address or whatsoever, he will be not be able to penetrate the system if his physical signature doesn't, uh, doesn't comply with what you have in your database. So you can think about this as a kind of a really biometrics, but for network devices. So what is the next uh, perspective? It's the attacker's perspective, of course. Then, get, thanks to this kind of fingerprinting on building signatures, an attacker can identify variable targets host on the network, and this is commonly, you all know very well, commonly used now in a network. Uh, it can also be used for privacy violation. So if you're able to build these sig uh, this signatures, we'll be able to track people uh, just by uh, observing the traffic. And we don't need any kind of identifiers or whatsoever to read from the traffic. 
And we can also use it for protocol compromise. Um, here I mentioned uh, it was a recent work last year or two years ago, I'm not sure, shake them up. They build a protocol that is able to, um, to establish keys between two devices based on the fact that it's not possible to say which device sends the, the bits. But if you are able during that process of key establishment to recognize which device exactly it's sending, then this type of protocols will directly be compromised. So I will not go in more details about uh, uh, this protocol compromise, but if you look at the Shake Them Up uh, paper, then you see that uh, if you're able to identify the device, then the protocol doesn't make sense anymore. So what is the typical scenario of hunting the individuality? So usually we have a, a fingerprinter that observes the traffic to and from a targeted device, which we usually call as a fingerprint, fingerprint E, in order to find characteristics that distinguish the device or some of its components. And of course, fingerprinting uh, or signature making looks for characteristics in all layers, application, network, link, and physical layers. In the next slides, I'll talk primarily on the physical layer, because this is something that uh, it's believed to be much more difficult to spoof or to change, because it's due to the inherent, inherent manufacturing and specification characteristics in the device. So even if you produce a device in the same manufacturing line, it will have different capacitors or different uh, um, resistors that will influence the, the way the device uh, um, transmits information on the physical layer. And uh, usually, as you see on the next uh, slot, this is, uh, these characteristics usually come from implementation problems, or not really problems, just how the system is implemented, and hardware imperfections, which are very hard to uh, actually try to make the same, like clock skews, for example. And there are two main approaches in fingerprinting. One is active and the other is passive. The active one, you can initiate communication with the device if it's possible, like uh, passive RFID tags, you're able to query the device and see what its response is, or passive identification where you just observe how the device communicates with you. And this is usually in wireless transceivers, you can only observe the traffic. Okay, so this is, it was just general background to what is device biometrics, why we are hunting the individuality. And now I'll start with the first, with the first case, which is the case of wireless transceivers. Uh, so, wireless radio specification and manufacturing process are quite complex, uh, complex nowadays. And the previous work has shown that significant differences in the behavior of the physical layer even within the same specification from different devices. Here on the picture on the, on the right and on the left is the, it's two different uh, uh, wireless cards which support 802.11 standard. And you could see that even if they implement the same specification with the same, uh, with the same um, mm, how to say, delays and what, and delays and timings, you could see the difference. This is the picture shows actually before the transmission of the packet. This is uh, the part, this doesn't, this work, yeah. The packet at the beginning, this is just the noise level. And then before each packet transmission, we have a ramping up period, which is defined by the specification. And then after the ramping period, the power goes up to full power, then the transmission starts. And you could see that the same protocol specification and on the physical layer actually has completely different uh, signals for these two uh, um, uh, wireless cards. And previous work has shown that uh, different manufacturers are kind of a very easy to distinguish each other just on observing this, uh, uh, this physical communication at the beginning. So, then we decided to go a step further and see, okay, can we distinguish based on these characteristics even identical devices, which are the same hardware, the same uh, model, and same specification? And uh, in the next slides, we, we will show some results and also some limitations of the approach and also some attacks that uh, 
we found relevant in this type of techniques. So what is the motivation about looking um, uh, at identical devices? So uh, we would like to have reliable identity verification of wireless devices for various reasons, like we want to de detect illegal transmitters, we probably want to detect if someone has spoofed your MAC address and trying to pretend to be yourself. So uh, it also can be done for device cloning or key compromise. And uh, that's why we decided just to go and dig on the physical layer and see what can be done there. And usually these characteristics, as I said before, they come from uh, just hardware imperfections in the device. So it's very hard for a manufacturer to just make all the devices completely unique so that we cannot just distinguish. It's also like human nature. I mean, we all have different fingerprints, different faces, and so on. So what was our setup? Uh, it's just gen the general picture. So we used for, the, for this experiment 50 uh, wireless sensor nodes. These are actually T-Mode Sky sensor nodes. Exactly the same model. We purchased it at the same time, so they are likely to be also from the same production line. We just wanted to make sure that we have more or less the same, uh, the, exactly the same devices. Uh, then we built a, a special signal acquisition setup, I'll present in the next slides, to collect the physical data uh, characteristics from each transmitted packet. This process actually is quite uh, crucial. We need to do it in such a way that we are, not, we are not compromising or adding additional, let's say, noise or signatures in, uh, in the process, or at least minimize as much as possible. We always add, but at least minimize as much as possible. Then, then the typical statistical part starts afterwards. We try to extract features from that physical data uh, layer, and then try to see, compare with features that we have in other identification database, is it our own device or it's another device? And for that we used 50 identical devices. So are we able to say if it's our own device or it's another one? So that's the generic framework. So the first step, the first step is the signal acquisition. Sorry. Actually here you can see our setup in um, uh, in the building. Uh, this is the simplified setup. And here is the diagram. Uh, all these components here from the capturing antenna, which is this big uh, standard horn antenna. Uh, this antenna is specific that it has very, for indoor environment, has very good um, um, capturing uh, and very strong uh, uh, gain. And it's good to use inside environment. Then we have an, an amplifier. We definitely need to amplify the signal at a certain extent, otherwise we cannot distinguish uh, very well the features. Uh, this amplifier is quite critical, so we used a, a very low noise, ultra low noise amplifier, quite expensive. It costs around uh, 3,000 uh, euros just for this um, experiment. If you use a normal amplifier such as one on a, on a on, on a device, uh, on a normal device, you're not able to, to find the small imperfections in the signal. And then we pass through some kind of a bandpass filters, uh, uh, a special also mixer, and we recorded the signals on a high, high frequency oscilloscope, so that with a really high sampling rate, we're able to see at a very, even the small imperfections in the signal. And this is the setup here, so uh, the signal of the, the, all the devices emit. Uh, the signals are recorded from the, from the antenna. They pass through the, uh, all the, amp the, the filters in the mixers, recorded on the oscilloscope and on, uh, on our laptop. And then you are able to build uh, reference features and test features and try to compare and see, can we distinguish these devices? So what did you use for, uh, for this? So the 802.11b uh, protocol defines a ramping up period before transmission starts. So this is, so here we have the noise level, then the signal will gradually, the specification defines a time uh, for ramping up the signal to full power, and then here actually the, the second part is the actual transmission. 
And this shape of the physical layer, you see it on each packet transmission in a 802.11 device. Uh, why this is in the standard? It's usually for uh, the gradual ramping ensures that there is no spectral interferences within same devices. In the, it's kind of a first, uh, make sure um, that we don't uh, interfere that much. So the signal goes gradually powered up and not directly. It, it could be, it's perfectly possible to directly ramp up the signal in the beginning. So we use this part, which it's usually referred to as the transient part, and you extracted some statistical features from it based on uh, different spectral transforms, which uh, I'm not mentioning in the presentation. And, uh, and the results were quite amazing. Uh, after we also trained the system using uh, some pattern uh, recognition classifiers, then we are able for 50 identical sensor nodes to have uh, a recognition accuracy of almost uh, 99 or 100%. So in 99% of the cases, we are able to say if it's uh, node number one or node number 50 or 49 or whatsoever that is transmitting at that moment. And this was under the same conditions of the signal. So the nodes were positioned uh, exactly at the same distance from the antenna so that we don't interfere in this ramping up signal. Uh, so under the same conditions, they were these features here were distinguishable. Even though if you look on different samples by just uh, eye, uh, visual inspection, you could not see a difference. But the statistical meanings uh, could find the small imperfections in, inside this ramping up signal. And uh, here, actually, we varied uh, the recognition. This graph shows the false accept and the genuine accept rate for different types of, for the number of signals that we use to extract the features. So if you use more signals from the device to extract the features, like 40 different packet transmissions, then we had the highest accuracy. As long as you use less, uh, less signals to, beat the, to build the characteristic features, then this accuracy drops quite significantly here. So this is due to the fact that uh, using less number of signals has more noise. So we more we round up um, average over multiple, multiple samples, better the performance is. Uh, and these results are also kind of comparable to biometric fingerprint recognition with uh, an equal error rate of around 0.24%. That's, uh, that was our finding, even on identical same hardware, same model uh, devices. So afterwards, we, this experiment on, on, that, on this site was under the same conditions. So same distance from the antenna, uh, same antenna polarization, so that we don't disturb the, the shape of the signal. And then we decided to see what will happen if we go over a bigger distance. The initial experiment here was done over 10 meters. So we collected the signals from 10 meters of, from the sensor devices. So on this one, we decided to see how far we can go. And uh, we used uh, a university parking space, uh, which is uh, like 40 meters distance. So we collected the signals from 40 meters. Ex ex exactly the same conditions again. And the accuracy was exactly the same, more or less, uh, within the statistical error. So even with high di over a very high distance for this sensor device, which transmit around, the maximum is around 150, between 50 and 100 meters indoors, we are able to distinguish which device has emitted the signal. Then we also performed some experiments on the voltage. So we tried to measure what happens because these devices run on battery supplies what's happening if the, the battery goes down and uh, to reaching uh, its end level, then also the shape was consistently uh, unique within different voltage levels. Where we had problems and where the system didn't work very well is when we tried to do on different antenna polarizations. Uh, we just tried to vary the antennas of the device between each transmission and see if, uh, if these features are preserved. And then 
we could say that uh, from around 10 sensors that we used for this experiment, only four were kind of consistently recognized. So if someone is changing the, the antenna polarization of the device, this has an implication on, on this shape change here, and then our features were not, in, not good enough to, uh, to say, oh, this is the device one or device two. We are currently exploring other techniques in order to solve this issue, and uh, I don't have uh, results, but they're usually promising that even with changes of antenna polarization, by using some smart statistical training and kernel methods, we are probably able to distinguish even between different antenna polarizations. So that was uh, the part about uh, wireless transceivers, and I'll go forward with the uh, cool stuff, which is RFID tags. Are there any questions at that level? Yes? Yeah, temperature, we, we didn't test extreme temperatures, we tested only on temperature, on uh, indoor temperatures, and there were no differences. What about how long the device has been running? Yeah, we also tested on, uh, we ran it like for, usually this experience was like for 20 minutes, and also for one hour, and there was no difference. This is kind of a, not a problem given the fact that these are low-power devices. The thing, what we didn't test is that these were all the time regular transmissions. We did not test if the device transmits very intensively for some amount of time and then it stops. This we did not uh, experiment in this, uh, in this setting. We just used regular transmissions, 500 milliseconds per packet for uh, one hour. We could see some deviations at some moment, but they were, they were not influencing that much the accuracy, plus minus one or two percent. Yes? Yeah, so for building one signature, so this is, we, we kind of evade from 5 to 40. So if you want more, like the best accuracy we get after kind of a, if you see the graph here, after 30, the accuracy is almost the same. So around, yeah, 30 packets. Yes. Anything else? Yeah? What kind of electrical? So I didn't understand. The electrical components of these wireless devices over time, they age. Yeah, they age. We, yeah, that's, that's something that we have not tested, uh, over aging. If we use it, uh, I actually intend to do this experiment uh, after six months again and see what happened with the devices. Because we didn't have, uh, in the period of time, it was within one week, we didn't have time to, to see these differences. But I would say that as a, even human biometrics, these properties will change. And usually in fingerprinting or face recognition, you need to do um, <laughs> regular changes because, yeah, it's like even code will change your, yes. yes? Yes, so the question is, uh, uh, is this a setting where only one emitter is setting at the same time or multiple emitters? So in the results I present here, uh, especially this graph, is one signal emitter at a time. So we kind of got rid of, of uh, any noise coming from our devices. Uh, if we, because these devices have a MAC layer, usually it's ensured that at the same time, the, the same time there is only one device emitting. So at that time, the experiments are reproducible. If there were, uh, uh, we tested also with um, uh, the same devices emitting at the same time, we could capture the signals in the same way, multiple transmitters. We did not test if we have external noise from other, let's say, 802.11 or other devices. And this might kind of increase the noise levels and might prevent actually fingerprinting in some cases. But as long as we keep with the same, within the same protocol, even if you have multiple devices, the system works. Uh, transmitting at the same time, sorry. Yeah, other questions? Okay, so that's part on, uh, 
um, and I, actually not completely. Uh, here I want to mention some of the attacks that we measured because, okay, it's very nice. We can probably uh, do this kind of things. So what happens if we try to prevent fingerprinting? So we experiment with uh, uh, two types of attacks. The first one was an uh, uh, impersonation attack. So what we did is um, we, we decided to do the following. If, can we, in some sense, uh, find similar shapes and by varying the antenna polarization of these shapes to match a device fingerprint so that we can impersonate that device? And actually, the answer to that question, we, we took three different sensors, which were not part of the population of these 50 sensors that we had. So they were three, again, the same model, same manufacturing. And then we started sending signals to our system with different antenna polarizations. And the results show that if we use here like n, n equal 5 or 10 um, signals to build a feature, the system is vulnerable to impersonation by changing the polarization of the antenna of an intruder device. As long as we keep the number of signals to build a feature, the signature, higher than 20 or 30, then the chances became uh, uh, quite low to impersonate the system. But even though this is uh, not an experiment that uh, kind of says, oh, it's difficult to impersonate the system, it's probably possible to build a device that imitates the shape completely uh, and by varying to kind of impersonate a device. The second type of things we did, we try to see how the shape actually is influenced if you use some jamming, wireless jamming attacks. And there, we're able to actually jam the signals at the beginning. And this also prevented fingerprinting because the, the shape of the signal was changing quite a lot at the beginning. So as long as we have uh, interference uh, with the signal uh, from some other device, uh, this kind of method fails to, to recognize the device. So this can be used, for example, for an authority to prevent fingerprinting of the devices by sending regular uh, specific uh, signal interference on the channel. And then the last type of attacks that uh, actually we are currently investigating is trying to replay the signals on the physical layer by using some sophisticated equipment. If, if we are able to replay the uh, the signal, then we also can compromise the, the system. Yeah, questions uh, of the attacks? Um, yeah? In replaying the signal, wouldn't you still have to match the antenna polarization? Exactly, yeah. We have also to match the antenna polarization, use uh, very expensive uh, um, signal generators that are able to um, uh, completely reproduce the signal originally at 2.4 gigahertz. And this equipment is usually more than 150,000 uh, euros. So until now, it's with little success for us. But if it's possible to replay this, uh, this kind of, um, we'll break the system. Okay, so that was the first case on wireless receivers. This was kind of a more mature work uh, that uh, we decided to present. And uh, now uh, we will demonstrate our efforts on uh, actually try to build physical signatures for RFID transponders. Uh, what was the motivation of this? Uh, actually, this slide is probably, yeah. So if we're able to do some identification or classification, we will probably be able to detect cloned or counterfeit devices. Uh, and we also, if you can build signatures, we probably can complement complement some security security mechanisms, uh, existing security mechanism for authentication, for example. And of course, on the attack side, we can subvert privacy systems at the hardware level. So the goal for us here was to try what kind of physical signatures we can extract from uh, from um, uh, RFIDs using um, uh, using the physical layer. So here I just want to put a small video, which uh, I really liked. Uh, it was a, a guy from, from Holland. Probably he's some here, some probably here it's in the group or not. But uh, we really liked uh, his work. So he was able to uh, clone his own uh, Dutch passport, which contained an i 4 g chip data. 
and he was able to present that to a web check-in terminal and get accepted with a, with a picture of, of Elvis Presley. Okay, so here is the demo from his website. I gave the details so you can go and look by yourself afterwards. Uh oh. Very nice. Ah, we don't have. Why we don't have a network connection? It's just use your phone, so. Yeah. Actually, I think I, I will be able to put it finally. Repeat it again. <laughs> no. Okay. Huh? Yeah. There is one. Uh, apparently, no. Okay. Sorry, you have the website, so please, you have the laptops, go and check it. Um. Okay, so what uh, Von Gig did is uh, he was able to, uh, to break the system and go and present his fake uh, Jacob card on the web check-in. So we decided to see, okay, can we do something against this? Of course, if we clone the, the data, we cannot distinguish which, if it's your own passport or something else. Uh, so with uh, uh, my colleague especially, he, um, he, he started implementing uh, and almost completely finished uh, the experimental setup. So we built uh, an RFID reader ourselves, uh, which is just these two generators. One was used to uh, generate the, uh, the envelope of the signal to implement the, I'll show you later, to implement the commands of the RFID reader. And the other one is the carrier generator that uh, carries the, modulates and carries the, the data. Here we can see the transmitting antenna. So our signal from the, from the generators were going to the transmitting antenna, and here we had an eavesdropping antenna. So we were able to record on oscilloscope again the transmission, physical, the physical layer of the, of the RFID transponder. Uh, so some things that, we, uh, that he had to really take care of was to make everything completely stable so that we don't have any antenna differences or whatsoever. So uh, we built this kind of a, a wooden device, fixed. Here it's, uh, it's explained. So that we have all the time, every time we put a, an, an RFID transponder, it has exactly the same conditions. So that we don't introduce any signature due to different positioning or antenna polarization or whatsoever. And uh, of course, everything should be non-metallic to avoid, uh, um, to avoid uh, interferences. So that was kind of our lab in that time. And uh, here we could just say about the, the, the transactions. So uh, the devices uh, respond to two types of commands according to the specification. One is type A and one is type B. Here's a typical wake-up command of the B of the B uh, of the B protocol, the type B. Beginning, the device needs to be uh, uh, powered up for some amount of time, and this ensures that every time afterwards we have a different uh, uh, puppy number, which ensures against anti-collision. And then we have the wake-up command. Here is the data. It's 10% ASK modulated uh, over. And then here afterwards, this part is the response of the device, which contains the puppy and some other modulated data. So how we can build the signature from this? Uh, no, sorry, I'll talk about yeah, the response first. So afterwards, <coughs> after we send this command from our fake reader, we get the response of the, uh, of the device which is in binary phase shift keying, and usually uh, it's, uh, the subcarrier is 16 times less than the carrier frequency, which is around 13.56 uh, megahertz. So this is how the response looks like in more details. 
Um, here we have the anatomy of the B prot of the A protocol. Sorry. So here is a completely different uh, modulation uh, modulation scheme. It's a 100 TSK modified mirror encoding again at 106 kilobits uh, uh, baud rate. And here we see the response of the of the device. So the response is on of keying of the data that comes out. And it again, it has the puppy number and everything the same. And every bit starts with defined phase relation to the subcarrier. So what we did afterwards is that, okay, we could closely simulate the RFID reader. So we sent him a standard command. And then afterwards, we decided to vary the, the frequency of sending the data and also the baud rate. And you, you can see on the next slide, actually this you try to see how the device responds to different type of out of spec frequencies and, uh, and baud rates. And here on this slide we can see some uh, really nice results. So this on the first graph we could see the, the standard command at 13.56 megahertz. It's almost like a real reader. Uh, if we have a frequency which is close to 13.56, we observe uh, a, also a good response, but different timings. We could not see this from this picture because it's not zoomed enough, but the difference between the end of the command and the start of the response from the device changes on different frequencies. Uh, if we try to go a little bit out of spec of the, of the, frequen of the frequencies, like uh, 10 megahertz, we can see that the device tries to respond. And actually, some devices will try to respond, others will not try to respond. And actually, their response will be different also. And here on the graph D, we could see the device, one of the devices that actually uh, tried to respond, actually tried to collect, and he couldn't even read the, um, uh, the wake up command that we have sent. So, based on this kind of observations, on the different timings, uh, in, the, in the communication with the, with the transponder. Uh, we, were kind of, we were kind of able to distinguish between our devices that we have. And unfortunately, we have had only six different um, RFID chips on passports. <laughs> and uh, some of them implemented type A, some implemented type B, but and these timings that we observed were kind of a consistent between each different run on, a, on the same device. So unfortunately, we need much more transponders and actually different types of devices in order to more, kind of a more precisely categorize how effective is this to distinguish between uh, the devices at the moment. So we don't have really uh, more data than, than this. Uh, then this is about uh, protocol dependent, so we just emulated the, the type A and type B protocols and tried to play with the different frequencies. Then another type of experiments my colleague uh, did, uh, we tried to expose the device to different types of completely independent, uh, uh, independent um, uh, protocol independent uh, noise or uh, energy. And actually, these three experiments, one, we just exposed the, the device to white noise and see how it reacted. We also exposed it to um, different linear sweeps over uh, different frequencies and also to some burst of sinusoidal RF energy. And here I'll show you the shapes that we kind of obtained from uh, devices. So this. These are kind of a shapes from type A and B. It doesn't, it doesn't matter on the protocol because it's an uh, independent um, experiment. So here are the kind of shapes that we could see from devices. Uh, and they have some interesting artifacts for analysis, like uh, these peaks at given frequencies here, and then kind of a, uh, almost noise at the end. So we could see these kind of shapes. They look uh, very nice for uh, statistical analysis that we are currently actually performing. And uh, here it's another type of uh, um, also uh, uh, RF energy that we submit to the device and we could see a different shape of the device. So what our observations currently are that different classes of devices had different shapes 
once they responded to this uh, uh, RF energies. Okay, so that's uh, more or less uh, yeah, everything on the <laughs> I4D transponders. Are there any questions? Yeah, it's, um, so, what we'll conclusion? Yes? Uh, you only try dashboards, so active yes. active devices. Uh, passive devices. Passive devices. Passwords are passive. Yeah, they just okay. respond they, yeah, on some kind of a command. Okay, I will just uh, conclude. So, uh, uh, according to our experience, we could say that passive and active devices exhibit unique behavior uh, due to manufacturing variations and, uh, hardware, uh, and hardware in the hardware components. And such variations are definitely inherent to the device itself, but uh, they're kind of a very difficult to extract and to capture. So we need a very sophisticated equipment, high-frequency oscilloscopes, Mm, also uh, signal analyzers and so on in order to really capture these differences. In some cases it's uh, not really possible. And uh, this kind of individuality, if we can uh, find it, it can be useful in both defenses and offensive scenarios as I mentioned previously. So that's uh, everything on my side today. Okay, I'm going to respond a bit further to this gentleman's question over here. Um, he was asking about the kinds of transponders we've looked at. We've been focusing mostly on the uh, ISO 14443 transponders that you find in uh, passports. Uh, I've also looked at uh, the 14443 chips that are, for example, in contactless credit cards and other kinds of systems that I've studied. The reason why here we're focusing primarily on passport chips is we want a wide range of devices that are still in some sense comparable to one another. So we also, we also have data actually taken from some random other kinds of inlays that we didn't even include with our data here, although we've looked at it. And it's because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to compare a cereal box to a passport. We want to be able to show our ability to categorize between different devices that are all intended to operate more or less the same. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, did you try to reproduce your results with different antenna polarizations uh, and try to make some, try to uh, compute the polarization out uh, so to make it neutral to the polarization of the of the antenna we are collecting the same data uh, with only different polarizations so you can build a match on each one yeah i understand so the question is uh, if we can compensate the antenna polarization and try to match again we have not that done such an experiment because um, for various reasons we we kind of assume that it's very difficult to compensate with adding the different polarization we'll have a diff even if you compensate this with a, it will add a signature that is not uh, really new to the device so we couldn't find a way to add it to compensate this with uh, the device uh, signature so that's why it didn't work <laughs>